All right, let's so check out the backdrop in this one. I uh, stole another video from my How to Hunt channel, and I let the camera rip from this logging road bridge. I hit it under the bridge so nobody would see it, and I just left it there in the dark. And then I videotaped uh, First Light. But anyway, the significance of this spot is you can see the snow slide in the background. That's the face of Mount Curry, British Columbia. And uh, there's been so many sightings right there, it's stupid. And the timber on the left, I had a huge shriek come out of there one time when I was making videos about a quarter mile to the left. And what else? And another thing too is one time late spring, I was setting up two cameras and I was leaving them there for, I think they were going to record for a few hours each and I put them back to back. And one was facing up the slide and the other was facing down the slide in the valley bottom. There's still a bit of snow there, and a friend of mine, his girlfriend, came with us, and Sarah, and we were walking through the timber, just coming, breaking out into the riverbed, about 300 yards shy of that snow slide you can see in the video. And they were about 20 yards behind me at that point, and something, we are going next to these uh, spruce trees, and all of a sudden, all three of them basically jolted straight to the right as they were walking up. And they said... They said that it almost they felt it through their body. They thought it was like a bear growling or something making a weird sudden sh sound. I didn't. I thought I heard something, but whatever it was, I mean, I've been in, a, in and around there. I don't know, a dozens and dozens and dozens of times. So I already know that the whatever is around there, they've given me a free ticket. So, but it was really uh, there's really something else to see how wide eyed and how almost utter breath they were from whatever sound or whatever it was that was projected on the three of them from those trees and it scared the living shit out of them and then there's me oblivious didn't hear feel a thing crazy right so anyway um i thought i'd you could watch this sun come up here and i've never really watched it through who knows maybe you'll see something river maybe you won't i don't know but that's what i did so here we go well i've got what i got here two days left two days i got one more sleeper and then I travel. And then it'll take me a couple days to get home. And then uh, it'll be kind of funny. I'm going to get our driveway is a long driveway up to the house. And, I'm gonna, and you can see the main road from the house. So I'm going to get Sarah to kick me out on the road and then drive up to the house. And then she's going to videotape from there. And I'm going to put a GoPro on me and, I'm gonna, and then get her to kick the dog loose. She's a freaking monster now. And apparently she's being real protective of the property. So it's going to be real funny to see her reaction. To see some man standing there coming down the driveway. She's going to shit herself. And then uh, we'll see how that reunion goes. I think it'll be pretty cool. Anyways, can't wait to see her and everyone else. But anyway, in the meantime, here we go. Who do we got? This email is titled, Interview with Sabe and Family. Greetings and Merry Christmas slash Happy New Year and all that shit since. Steve and Sarah, all your fur babies. Love your menagerie. I started this back in November 11th, 21. Not sure if I mailed it, but I hope not as I had not completed it and left it sitting in my composed box. So, I'm now finished with this and yes, I know, it's kind of lengthy, but I'm following your lead. You have said many times you'd rather we send it long than not send it at all. Take from it what you will, right? This is completed on December 22nd, 21. Last one of the year. But this is now April 1st, and I'm sending this out to you again. Not sure if it was lost or may be sent to the wrong email. So I'm going to do it again. Greetings, Steve. This is Catherine. Again, from the South Slash Central Ozarks. You have read a few of my emails recounting my experiences in the Ocala National, Florida. My husband Bob and I listen to you at bedtime and I frequently visit your YouTube site during the day. I enjoy your soothing voice and great emails. I'm finally at the point in my healing, I had surgery on both my hands, that I think I can type up a reply to the last email I sent you that you read November 4th, 2021. Got that you guys? November 24th, November 4th, 2021. For those that don't know or forgot the first big, e big email was done August 15th, 21. I'm going to forgo any personal demographics as I've already covered that in past emails. That's okay. I'm going to answer some questions 
and address comments from your How to Hunt following in regards to my prior emails and address, some comments in, regarding, in regards to other submitters. I hope this helps. My knowledge base for addressing these issues is from personal contact, both from years ago and over the years. I'm not proclaiming to be an authority, but I am telling you and your followers that whatever I say is the absolute truth that I have acquired either one-on-one -on -one slash face-to-face -face, or has been shared to me in mind speak. I will repeat to you and your followers that I'm no BS, straight shooting, logical realist. I don't make a habit of lying and I wouldn't do so for myself or anyone else. Number one, I want to address your comment. You asked after reading my last email. You asked if I or anyone had answers, answered in regards to quote, trackers, end quote. Yes, I remember asking that question. Not sure this will give you all the answers you want. It is, or it is what you're looking for, but I can give you what I know. Trackers fall into different categories. A, there are human trackers that focus on tracking, documenting, and reporting their target, which would be Bigfoot slash Sabe, to whoever sent them out typically government and or organizations that make it a point to track and destroy. Targets can be Bigfoot slash Sabe, Dogman, UFOs, portals, and other things that fall into the cryptic paranormal categories. Number two, trackers can also be those individuals who misleadingly tell the general public they are researchers, but they are not just researchers. They are also trackers who document where different Sabe tribes and families are living notify whoever they report to, what they have found, how many, and the location. And this is documented to watch migratory routes and those who do not migrate. This tracking system operates much like a census and is not always the best interest of Sabe. Number three, there are also bad Sabe that fall into different categories that are trackers of humans that have been marked and or tagged by a good Sabe individual, family, and or a tribal friend. They can become prey by the bad sabe to frighten and or hurt the good sabe and make them easier to find. The bad ones were turned by some organization or a governmental agency to track sabe in general. Number four, additionally, there are trackers who like to keep track of sabe. These individuals are not specifically researching sabe but like to document where they can be found. Not always good or kind results. Number five, not all Sabe is the same. There are many different ones. Just like humans, we come in different colors, bodily types, body types, heights, weights, races, and or tribes, language, etc. I was told by the big guy that there are many of his own kind, but from different tribes that have been caught by the human leaders and turned to attract their own kind, to hate their own kind, that they are the big ones usually 10 feet plus or more with red eyes. The Sabe, like him slash the big guy and his tribe, fear. The big black ones with red eyes are bad. They not only kill his kind, but humans as well, especially friends of the good Sabe. There's a Cherokee word for the spirit people or people of the woods called Nanehe, sometimes referred to as the hairy man. Additionally, Kanati, pronunciation Kanati, refers to the people of the woods that lived in unison with the native tribes and Manny Cherokee long before the man with white face came. This means to hunt god-like protector. In Cherokee myth mythology, Kanate was the first man and guardian of the hunt. It was Kanate who taught the people the skill of hunting. His name probably derived from the Cherokee word for hunter. Kanaholedal Kana Kano Halidohi. Kano Halidohi. Different native tribes have their own words to describe the hairy man of the forest, the watcher of the woods, protector of the hunt. The ones associated with killings, kidnapping, and such are associated with the bad ones, sometimes called a raven mocker. The raven mocker, or Kalani Aiki Liski, is an evil spirit and the most feared of Cherokee witches. According to the Cherokee mythology, it robs the sick and dying of their heart, normally appearing as old, withered men and women, or returning completely invisible except for certain medicine men. They take to the air in a fiery shape 
with the sounds of a raven's cry and a strong wind as they hunt for their next victim. After tormenting and killing their victim by slitting the victim's head, they consume his heart, doing so without leaving a mark on the victim's skin, and add a year to their life for every year that the slain would have still lived. The sound of a raven mocker means that someone in the area will soon die. Raven, mar raven mockers are normally invisible when feeding, but those with strong medicine can not only spot them, but cause them to die within seven days. Medicine men will sometimes stand guard over the dead to prevent raven mockers from stealing the heart of the afflicted. Raven mockers are feared and envied by the other witches of Cherokee folklore, and their bodies may be abused by said witches after death. Number six, bad smell. As in many stories associated with Bigfoot slash Sabby, there are countless references to the smell, and there are countless descriptions as to what the smell smells like. Explanation. As I know and understand it, each Sabby is born with a gland and is located approximately in the area where we have our tailbone. Each Sabby has his or her own smell, and the smell can change depending on the intent, but they usually only have a couple. They primarily use this smell to alert and or warn those around where they are. More likely than not, it's a deterrent to keep humans and or other animals away. Or, the other smell is used to frighten, scare, or put fear into whoever the Sabe wants to keep away that is usually the smell that smells the worst. They will release the smell more than once if the human persists in ignoring the warning. Number seven, most of the antagonistic behaviors Meted against humans are done by juveniles, typically bored and having fun aggravating their favorite victims, humans, and they usually react in the way that makes the juvenile savvy have the most fun. Just like human adolescents will do stupid shit to aggravate adults or other juveniles, no different for savvy. Most often they would stop if no one paid them any attention, but there are some savvy who never grew up and carry on their bad behavior into adulthood. Sounds familiar. You got it. Number eight, Sabi has an amazing ability that many Sabi refer to as be like the forest. Many humans think they become invisible, but they basically meld into the forest, hence be like the forest. Kind of sort of like invisible, but not exactly. Humans can stand right next to them and never know they are there. Humans who have been tagged can sometimes sense their presence but if you have never been tagged, you're not going to know they are there. But most, not all, but most dogs and cats will know. Number nine, not all Sabe dislike dogs and cats, though fewer dogs than cats, and not all dogs and cats dislike Sabe. It really depends on the human associated with the animal, and if the human has basically sent the animal sac slash sacrifice their beloved protector to seek them out. It is felt that if the human does not care what happens to their animal, most Sabe won't either. Though some Sabe has favorite breeds, and some Sabe actually has one or two to protect their own camp. The good Sabe will treat your pets and those you care about respectfully. But if the human is, has no respect for animals or other humans, the Sabe won't either. Number 10. Sabe will sometimes break the silence to step out to protect a child or a human and save their life. But this will be a good Sabe. Humans can and are taken by bad ones. They have been some, there have been some times when a human is left to die by a bad one that the good one will be aware of what's going on and will attempt to save the human if possible, returning them so they can be found. Humans who have been missing but are found later found can frequently fall into those parameters, but not all those that are missing. It has been explained to me that Sabe has lived for many long ago times. Now that seemed confusing to me, but I was told that Sabe in one life has lived and traveled from sun high to sun low many times. There were as many as the birds in the sky and with, and with as many friends. Few were their enemy, but that changed in this landmass when the man with white face came in great flocks and began to kill their tribal friends and his own kind. Understand his tribal friends were native tribes and basically the North American continent. I actually brought out an atlas and I got my answer for North American continent. 
but he said something that really shook me. He had indicated that the land mass I showed him in the atlas was different from what he remembered his father telling him. He said it was wrong. Yeah, I tried to probe that, but he was done. Esplanning? Done explaining, lol. To address his age, he was an adult male of many long years. When I met them first, when I was a mid-teen from early 68 to 72, and he was still going strong, when I questioned him about this, he reminded me that their time is longer than ours. I was also told that once you have become friends with a Sabe and you have established a relationship of some sort, but not based on nuisance visits from juveniles, they can and do tag you. In order to be tagged, it must be done by an adult Sabe that you have established some sort of relationship. In some circumstances, this relationship can be handed down through family lines slash members, and you can be tracked no matter where you go. I've been followed from Florida to Missouri, and they have communicated with me through MindSpeak through the years. Another point, Sabe do not look like a gorilla. Their facial features more realistically resemble humans than any primate, just saying. Okay, I just want to say that while it may seem I'm just dropping all this info at once, the information was not garnered all at once, sometimes taking me long stretches of prying and nagging to get the info. So, for those who like to make negatives or disbelievers, stick it. I would, rather, I would like to add that I continue to hear from the big guy. I have a big 8-foot wood silhouetted painted black of a sad bay propped against the front of my house by my bedroom window. I'm always protected, and they find it amusing. Laugh my hell, M-A-O. Yes, the Sabe love it. On a side note, I do not wear a mask unless in a medical environment where I have no choice. And even then, I will challenge the status quo, not wear it if I can get away with it. Regardless of whether I have or have not been jabbed with a needle or not is none of anyone's business. I have had the virus, and I have had other flus that were far worse. So I have my natural immunity. So, the FAU, all right, I should probably just stop. I'm, I'm going to politely not go with the, the rant on this topic because it'll get us deleted. Additionally, everyone needs to hold tight to their money and stash their money in a safe place at home, etc. When and if the dollar falls, the banks will lock us out and we will have not have access to our money. Store and hide what you can. As you know, Steve, you can share my name. Not my phone number, but you can call me whenever you like. Not just, bef just not before 10 a.m. LOL. As always, your friend Catherine Clow, the midget queen, and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, Valentine's, and all the rest we have passed. And to you and all the members of the roundtable, God bless to you and yours. Thank you so much for that email. And obviously, it doesn't matter who you are, what, what it is. If somebody has reached this level of communicating with these beings and share it all it's going to sound pretty freaking crazy isn't it but how would it not so take from what you will or leave it but don't blow a gasket all right and uh i wonder how many people out there listening right now are nodding their head in agreement with everything she just shared with you i wonder right because we've had more than a handful of people email in sharing their experiences with having basically friendships with these things with these things these people right but anyway that's a holy cow story all right listen up okay listen to this one this is titled portals my grandfather's story and google earth capturing big bigfoot on camera hi steven is mike i'm a combat veteran and new to your channel i have a lot of binge watching to do i haven't had an encounter or have heard them, but I have an open mind and can think for myself. Good for you, man. Welcome aboard. Our universe, universe is so vast with limitless amount of possibilities. We haven't even begun to scratch the surface. I truly believe that there is a link to missing people walking into portals unknowingly, and that these beings coming in and out of portals in order to get what they need from planet Earth. You know what, Mike? I think you're right. I've watched David Pilatus' videos where he reads emails and tells his missing stories. One of the things that stand out are the people who have walked in their surrounding areas for years and then suddenly experience their ears pop, change of atmospheric pressure, and they are not familiar with their surroundings. Or the hunter that walked into a clearing 
and saw a distorted air mass ahead of him. He walks up to the distortion and moves his leg toward it. To his shock and surprise, his leg disappears. He retracts his leg back from the portal and walks away from it. I'm convinced that these portals are very real, and hopefully with technological advancements, we will soon be able to understand these portals and where these beings are coming from. I also want to share a story with you. The story takes place in New Salza, Spremberg, a town in the district of Gorlitz in the free state of Saxony, Germany. It is situated on the border with the Czech Republic on the River Spree. My grandfather was approximately 17 years old in 1918. He was an avid outdoorsman, he loved hiking and mushroom hunting, and he would be in the woods for hours. So, one of the wives in town alerted the authorities that her husband never came home, and, of course, she was worried about him. A search party was put together, and so they went out to the area where she thought he might be. They searched for many days, trying to find him without any luck. Now it gets interesting. My grandfather got up one morning, put his hiking shoes on, left his house, and walked down the path he normally would take that, that led him to the woods. As he approached the woods, he saw a figure made of fog slash mist at the edge of the woods. As he approached the figure, it started limping like the wife's husband would. He followed this figure deep into the woods for over 30 minutes until the figure brought him to a small pond where the body of her husband was laying in. All that point, the figure slash, at that point, sorry, at that point, the figure slash mist disappeared. And he walked back home and let the authorities know where they could find the man's body. I saw this link on the internet today about Google Earth's picture of a possible Bigfoot. Thank you for all you do and always searching for the truth and stay safe, brother. Yeah, you too, man. And I absolutely appreciate that story. That is a holy shit story. And, uh... I have no doubt in my mind that that happened. Right? What a crazy, crazy experience. What the hell? There's <laughs> so much going on. You, know, you ever, some, I just get, sometimes I get frustrated the more I dig, and I dig in different directions to you guys, not just this topic, but I'm digging nonstop and I'm learning so much. And sometimes I feel, I just feel at times, I'm like, man, why? Why are we so dumb? Why are we so dumb? I'll just have those moments, the odd time, when I get a little overwhelmed. Have the amount of shit going on and how humans go about their lives. It's so bizarre to me. It's so bizarre. There's so much going on. You know, it's almost like I just feel, sometimes, a lot of the times, I just feel absolutely ripped off. You know what I mean? To be at the age I'm at now is when I'm really finally starting to learn real knowledge where before it's just a bunch of frickin' horse shit fed to me. You know? I get that a lot. But, gotta keep going, right? Gotta keep going. There's still time. There's still time to be a sponge, take it all in, and figure this shit out. And share it. Now, what's this picture look like? That does look interesting, doesn't it? And it's the picture, you know what I mean? Who knows? I guess if somebody put the coordinates, maybe they're in there. Um, and then you can look and see if it's there and nobody put it there. Yeah, interesting. I might do the, I might do a little Google I might do a little uh Google Earth surfing around the coastal mountains where I know these beings are and see if maybe one got caught. Like I got time to do that. Well I could probably pull off a little bit of that here maybe. But anyway, thanks again, man. Thank you so much. Now, who's next? This one's titled Lights in the Sky and Forest People and Helicopters. Hi, Steve. Please do not use my name. No problem. I live here in southern Ohio near Wayne National Forest with, the Sha with Shawnee National Forest a few miles away. And as to say, there's a lot of shit happening here almost on a daily basis. Please forgive the grammar. I'm not an expert at all. My neighbors up on the hill swear it's coyotes. I think when was the last time a coyote snapped a five inch thick tree in half at the four foot mark? I've been all through the hills here in the hunting season and on general hikes looking for the best spots for game. There's almost no time I haven't been noticed by them. At least it's how it feels to me. 
something was pacing me last week on the hill near my home. It moved, I moved. I moved, it moved. I stopped, it stopped. I still got a good bearing on where the sounds were coming from when I walked. An old trick my Native American grandfather taught me. It was close to about 40 feet or so away from me on the southern end of the ridge line. At that range you would think you could see something. Nothing, just woods and trees. Still, something was there and I could tell. I made a point to keep an ear out as my eyes were not seeing a thing. Yet there was something there and closer than I felt comfortable with. After time the feeling went away. I guess its curiosity was sated or it was all in my head. Not that's just one of the things that are happening on a regular basis here. A few nights ago, there was a loud crashing through the woods to the rear of the home. I instinctively, instinctively started timing the footfalls, three seconds to each footfall. In my mind, that came out to be about 16 feet tall. Whatever it was, was less than 60 feet away from my window in full sight of me. It was pitch black, but I could hear something breathing a few yards away. I was sitting on my computer on the second floor of the house when all this is going on. Something impossibly huge was watching me now and I didn't feel threatened. You would think you would think alarm bells would be sounding off in my head. Living this close to National Forest, I started hearing stories. Later confirmed that the rangers in Wayne National Forest shut down camping areas because there were so many sightings of them. As I'm only 12 miles away now, it's starting to make sense. There have been several UFO sightings around here over the last few months. The hills close to my home seem to be a light with some kind of white lights at just about any time of the night. Standing at the same window, I heard the giant in the field. I was now seeing lights and f lights like floods coming on and off across the hill. The thing though, Steve, they seemed to be coming from right over my house, across the hill, closest to my home. It was like there was something directly over the house, shining and panning lights over the woods of the hills. Not a sound was heard, totally silent. The woods, the woods did silent, not natural by any means here in southern Ohio. I've also taken several trail cams, put them out, caught some crazy shit on them as well. Nothing in the forest, people. More like ghosts of some kind. I'll send those pics along at some point, I guess. The craziest thing is, when we first got here several years ago, game was plentiful, and there was no issue with hunting. Since all this started about nine months ago, I've only seen one deer and one squirrel. This tells me there's a predator around that keeps them away. I base this one on the one deer I saw, hauling ass across the lower field off the hill closest to it. Stopped for a second, looked panicked, backed up the hill it just leapt from, then hauled ass up the other hill as fast as it could. Years of being in the bush all over the planet told me there's something up there. I've been up there a few times since then. Now they're marking my barn as their territory. I've found footprints, snapped trees, the teepees, and yes, a big X over the place. The thing that's oddest is all this is only 100 yards away from my home. I've been told by my grandfather's people, First Nations, I believe Cree, that they are like us. Leave them alone and they leave you alone. However, being me, I want to trade with them. Why not? My grandfather's people did. So why can't I? There also has been some strange aircraft from time to time hovering around the hills, mostly either white or black unmarked helicopters. They're always around after the lights have been seen. Makes me wonder if the weather station up on the hill no one ever goes to is a weather station. I've talked to people around the area here. They all know of them, but won't openly talk to anyone they don't know. There's a lot more going on over in Shawnee, but they won't admit to it. Honestly, the, the invisibu, invisibu thing is unnerving. The invisibu something is unnerving. Talk about an edge. As time goes on, I'll send more info, especially on my on my starting up trade with them. And well, I've spent enough of your time. You have others to get to best wishes. Okay, man, listen, sounds like you're on to something real frickin' interesting and possibly not safe, I don't know. I don't think the beings are the unsafe part. Probably if there is potential white guys there involved, that might be the, the potential danger part though, right? But those helicopters, 
videotape them. All right, we get a lot of reports of these helicopters being seen, and nobody nobody actually videotapes them. Um, and I'm guilty of that too because we've had them flying around our valley in the middle of the frickin' night too and real low to the river. Anyway, keep us posted. Keep us posted and snoop around, man. Be a snoop. Figure it out. Make sure you email us back with uh, whatever knowledge you have, all right? Whatever you find out. And if you can, try to get some of the people to crack open and start talking because it's not right to keep mouths shut. It's just not. I don't give a shit what the topic is. It's not right to keep our mouths shut anymore about anything. You know? And if somebody's hesitant to talk about it, I don't know, maybe fire them this video or something and share it with them and let them know that they're not alone. And just how big of a group of people on the planet actually know about what's going on. You know? That's the key, I think. That's the key. Who else do we got here? What's this titled? This is titled, The Smell. Alright. Mark, this is red. Hello, Steve. Thanks for taking the time to read this, and thanks for sharing the people's voices who've been dealt this shit sandwich. I know how rewarding and sometimes how totally exhausting our kind of lifestyle can be. I guess it's part of what attracts us to it. I've done my time commercial fishing the Gulf of Mexico and as a professional hunting guide in the central Texas hill country, as well as the south Texas brush country. I can only imagine how physically demanding it must be to commercial fish the Pacific Ocean and guide hunts in the backcountry of B.C., Hell, the altitude difference alone is tough on a flatlander like myself, lol. <laughs> I don't know how you do it, but thanks for taking away from your rest up slash heal up time in order to keep this and your other channels going. You've helped a lot of people, and my hat's off to you, sir. Thank you so much for the kind words, my man. And you know what? It's no different. You know what it's like. You get up way before first light, beat the living shit out of yourself, and then you go to sleep. <laughs> now... You might remember me from my share entitled, West Tennessee Encounter. I didn't notice any abnormal smell during that particular encounter, but I was upwind from it, and the closest it ever got was 40 to 50 yards from me before it turned and crashed away through the brush. I do, however, have a few theories to run by you and the group, and I think might explain the smell. I'm no meteorologist or a chemist, but I think there could possibly be a correlation between these smelly encounters and the ozone smell that often lingers in the air during and after an intense thunderstorm. If you've ever had lightning strike really close, you've probably smelled that strange, sometimes sulfuric, almost chemical smell. More on that later. I'm in my 50s and I've been lifelong outdoorsman. I've been around some pretty stinky stuff over the years, as I'm sure you have too. I've had to lay in shrimp boat bilge while I worked on the engines. That stuff stays with you, <laughs> no doubt. I've trapped, hunted, and skinned a few feral hogs, javelinas, and coyotes that would absolutely gag a maggot. Cleaned out fish boxes and freezers after power outages. And there's always that forgotten ice chest. However, I usually won't detect any foul odors from these stinkers until I'm right on top of them or a few feet downwind from them close enough to retrieve a carcass and slash or while I'm actually skinning one out and I still have a pretty good sense of smell. Once again, I personally have not smelled the smell and attributed it to a Sasquatch, but it's my opinion, these beings would have to be up close and personal and or directly upwind before a human would notice any naturally occurring BO. As a hunter, I wouldn't make it a habit to roll around in a rotting gut pile and go all summer without a shower before I go deer hunting. I just don't believe these things would consciously, consciously go around stinking to high heaven with their existence and apparent mission depends on going unnoticed. It just seems that they would be very careless on their part, but who am I to say? I'm thinking like a human hunter. Do they spray like a skunk or possess a scent gland like a javelina? Or, stay with me, possibly trigger a chemical reaction or some supernatural electrical discharge when they or whatever brought them here travels through the Earth's atmosphere or enters slash leaves this dimension through a portal of some kind. Okay, man, you know what? That is what I was talking to Dave about. Oh, I don't know, maybe last year I said, oh, I was just texting randomly and I just said, you know what, I, I got a funny feeling that maybe that scent comes from when they go to solid form here, maybe, as in possibly through a portal, whatever you want to call it, is it the residue from when they are right here with us? 
And you know what? Dave said, I agree. So, who knows? Who knows? Similar to what causes that strange smell during a lightning storm. Add in some burnt, singed Sasquatch hair, and that would definitely be a terrible smell. To me, an intelligent being such as a Sasquatch would quickly learn, soon after being born or soon after arriving here, that in order to successfully hunt and stay hidden in this world, it would need to remain unnoticed, and in this case, unscented. It has also crossed my mind they could possibly be using the scent, at will or otherwise, as an attractant to lure in small animals for prey. I can certainly see this working well to lure in dogs and other canines. Speaking of canines, could this being with the terrible smell be a dogman instead of a Sasquatch? We both know wild canines can be some of the rankest smelling critters in the woods. I've never seen anything I could positively ID as a dogman, but I reckon they would have a distinct overpowering odor to them. But here I go again, thinking like a human hunter. I guess it's also possible the witness and maybe even the Sasquatch itself could have simply had an accident when they actually saw each other face to face and up close. I know I almost shit my pants during my encounter and I only caught a partial glimpse of one coming towards me from across a small lake, lol. Steve, as you know, for whatever reason, our government officials and other dark forces on our planet really don't want us to know the truth about these and other politically unrecognized beings. Thanks to you, the contributors to your channels, and a few others who keep shining the light and sharing the voice of the people, sooner or later, one way or another, all the puzzle pieces will come together, and the truth will finally come out. Keep on shining that light, and singing the truth, brother. P.S. I've heard you mention the Nueces River in South Texas. I currently live in South Texas, not far from there. I had to hang up my white rubber boots and quit guiding hunts due to health reasons. But I still hunt, trap, fish, and camp as often as I can with my kids and grandkids. I personally have not had an actual Bigfoot sighting along the river, but I have heard some very strange sounds and witnessed some pretty weird stuff in those river bottoms, namely around Espen Espantosa Lake, pronounced Espantosa, in Dimmit County, Texas. Look it up. Lots of strange history around there. I also have a friend that told me a terrifying story about how one night several years ago he and some friends were chased all the way back to their truck from their fishing camp on the Nueces River in Duval County, Texas by a large screaming creature that was flanking them on the opposite riverbank. There also happens to be a small, little known, very remote naval air station located near that same stretch of the river. I'll try to get him to share his story, or maybe he'll let me share it for him on your channel. If ever back down here in the area, let me know. I'd love to meet you and swap some stories over a pot of campfire coffee. There's a whole lot more to South Texas than just rocks and cactus. Stay safe, brother. Enjoy it while you can, Mike. Okay, Mike, absolutely appreciate you sending that in. And I hope you're going to send more. And, and just share this video with your buddy. I'm sure that'll knee-jerk him, right? And, uh, yeah, I remember when I was down there, I just couldn't believe how hot it was, man. I was, like, dying. And, uh... It was so hot and that red, fine dirt. And I just couldn't believe there was deer running around down there. It was just so hot and, and dry and shitty. And, nope, but, nope there's the tracks. There are tracks all over the place and snakes frickin' everywhere. And I saw a huge snake in a pool in that river, too, and gar and all sorts of stuff. And then uh, getting back to the smells, you want to smell the smell. I had a, a guy who was an outfitter near I was living in where I was living in Pemberton, they guided a lot of bears, and I got a lot of bear meat from him at the end of the spring season, and I would put that meat in an old freezer in the back of the property, unplugged. And then throughout the fishing season, I would throw fish guts, anchovies, old bait, everything in that freezer with it, and I let, and water, and I let that shit percolate for months in the hot summer. You wanna talk about smell? Holy shit. It was like nuclear waste. And um, I took that shit up into the woods, and I was using it for for bait for wolves. And like I said, skinning out. You want to you want to talk about a stinky animal? A wolf is stinky. But anyway, I made um, little holes in the snow. I dig down a couple feet, and I put a I put I don't know a couple few gallons of that stinky, disgusting, rotting nuclear shit in those holes for the wolves to dig up and mill around. I trap them. And I put about 250 pounds of this stuff in this one area. 
and a female cougar and her two kittens ate it all. How disgusting is that? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Who would have ever thought that a cat, a large cat, would eat that disgusting shit? But she did. She ate it all. And the kids. But anyway. Yeah. Thanks for sending that in, Mike. And, um... Uh, for sure, if you can, make sure you send in your buddy's experiences. And that Nueces River, is, that, that thing isn't that wide. So if they were being, being flanked and screamed at from the other side of the river, that's like right there, right? Right there. But anyway, I'm going to get my button gear here. Got one day left, I think. Two, two days left. I'll be back sharing more shortly.